Amen. Would you pray with me, please? Father God, we thank you for a glorious day today. Not because the sun is shining, but we thank you for that too. It's a glorious day, Lord, because we're here to praise you. We're here to worship you, and we thank you as your children that we can come before you and sing praises to you. So, Lord, we just ask that you would use your word today to to continue to cultivate in our hearts the love that we need to be more like you. And you continue to use your word to transform our minds so that we wouldn't think like the world, but so that we would think like you. Jesus, you are everything. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you for what you've done for us. And we thank you for the way that you made for us. So we give you all the praise and the glory. It's in your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'd like to introduce you to a good friend of mine. Come on up here, Mike. Uh, he, if, if, you've, if you've been here, um, occasionally I will take a preaching break. For some of you, that's, that's probably a relief. So. <laughs> but every so often, uh, just I get tired of hearing my own self speak. So I need to take a little break. And I'm thankful because I've got a brother like Mike who... Um, he, he and I have a common heart. We've been, we've been in the battle together for a long time, and, and it's fun uh, to do something like this. Mike's come up here and spoken before. Uh, just a quick word about Mike. He is the director of Vital Men's Ministry. Uh, that's, that's our men's ministry, and it's all over the region. Um, it's really grown under his direction, and, and uh, um, he, just, he, he started his own construction company. And you know him. He's a home builder. He's, he's one of those guys who likes to get his hands dirty, but... But God has called him out of his construction business into full-time ministry. So he's taken a huge leap of faith, uh, and uh, we're, we're very thankful that he's here to bless us uh, with, with the way the Lord has gifted him. So welcome, Mike Sari. I think before we get started this morning, you guys got me keyed up with the, the video? Just a second. Let me know when you're ready. We've got a video we want to show this morning. Have you guys seen the, the video that came out, uh, the Bible that came out this last summer? That's coming, also coming into the theaters, I guess, this summer. That's going to be pretty exciting to see how God's going to work that out. But there's a, there's a portion of that video that I want to show you that really depicts about Jesus and the baptism. Because today, there's, there's two a couple of things we're going to look at. We're going to look at, we're going to look at the event, and we're also going to look at the commission. Because as we jump into the, the baptism of Jesus, because this is a really big deal. It becomes an event in his life that positions him. And I think sometimes in the midst of our lives, we have those things that come into our lives that all of a sudden creates position. And as we look at that position today, there's a portion of this video that I want to show you. And are we ready to go back there? Good to go. All right, let's watch the video. Well, again, this morning, we're going to look at the event and the commission. You know, when I sit there and I watch that piece of movie, and I even look in the scripture, I have to ask myself the question, and that's one of the questions this morning that I hope that we can find the answer to, is why would Jesus need to get baptized, and why do you need to get commissioned? You know, I'm sitting here thinking, here's the, here's the Son of God. Why would he have to be baptized? And, and this morning, I think those are the things that we're going to kind of look at, and we also took out a look at the commissioning. Because I look at commissioning, because that's also a that's a big deal. I think if you go back and you look in John at the very beginning, and Steve read that scripture for you last week, it talks about where John was in the wilderness, and then God calls him out of the wilderness to go and speak and to baptize the people. So he spends his whole lifespan of time after he leaves his family, he's in the wilderness. And then also, too, you go to the commission. I think of Isaiah in Isaiah 6. When Isaiah goes into the Holy of Holies, and here's, here's these seraphim, these, these six-figured creatures that are just floating around, and they're singing with such majesty, holy, holy, holy. And then Isaiah all of a sudden says, oh, no, I'm doomed. I'm a man of unclean lips. And then he hears the voice of God, and God speaks out to him and says, whom shall I send? And Isaiah is in the room, and I believe he's on his knees, and the seraphim come down, and they touch his lips, so the sin that is in his life is taken away. And Isaiah says, Lord, send me. 
So he gets commission. And the same thing, I think, in my own life uh, as going and, and studying it and, and the process of becoming a commissioned pastor and, and going through all the studies and all the things. And, and you go all through all this portion of your life. And I'm sitting here thinking at times when I was going through and that process started when I was 47 years old. I'm sitting here thinking, Lord, why did you wait so long to commission a man like me and also, too, in the midst of of my own brokenness. And we were doing all these studies, and then one day we had a test in the middle of the summertime, and we had several of the commission pastors were there, and several of the men that were also, too, going into a full-time ministry that was down with us as well that were out of Michigan. And we were being tested that day about Old and New Testament, and also, too, we also had to sit down in front of a panel and get interviewed of why we were called into ministry. And that was, you know, back then, man, there's a lot of studying, and I'm not just the best studier type guy, and, you know, I'm used to going out, and I'm bending nails, and I'm doing all that other kind of stuff. So that was a change. That was, that was a shift for me because I go back into high school, man. I don't know about you guys, but I just did enough to get through it. I, I, wasn't, a, I wasn't an A student by any means, but I just did enough to get, kind of get through it. That wasn't my thing. But anyway, I'm studying and doing all those things, and, and then all of a sudden, one morning, we get done, and we're having a break. And we're standing, we're at Third Church. I don't know if you guys have ever been in Third Church. Third Church is a, is, is a big place and is a big building. Well, any, anyway, we come out, and here we come out of our testing, and out through the room comes a guy riding a motorcycle, and he goes in to the building down below in the lower por portion of at Third Church. Now, atypical, I'll just be honest with you. You guys, there's, you don't see too many Harley guys showing up at third church in the middle of the week. It's the truth. This guy was all dressed. He had his leathers on. I mean, guy was cut. He was ripped. I mean, he, he was your atypical Harley guy. Well, he comes in, and he stands. And all the room freezes for a moment. I'm not kidding. It, just, it was just boom. You ever been there before where that moment just freezes? Well, anyway, everybody freezes, and I hear the Holy Spirit tell me, go. And man, I just, I just move into the situation. And I introduced myself and we were talking. I said, what brings you here today? Especially at a church. He goes, I was driving on my motorcycle. And he said, I just, something said for me to stop. And he says, I'm looking for a Bible. And I thought I might find one here. Isn't that interesting? I might find one at a church. Really? Well, anyway, <laughs> Well, anyway, he goes, and he, and he stops, and we're talking, and, and, um, and he goes, what Bible do you use? And I'm sitting there thinking, I had just bought a brand new Bible. I hadn't marked it up. My name wasn't in it or anything yet. So I go grab my Bible, and I give it to him. I said, here, take this. This is, this is what you're looking for. This is where the promises are. This is where the hope of life is. So I give that to him. And I said, sir, if you don't mind, can I pray with you? So we pray. And then he leaves. And now all these men are standing here. And only God sets up such things as this. And I'll never forget, Kevin comes up to me, puts his arm around me, and he says, Mike, I'm just so proud of you. You stepped in to an unknown situation and walk through it. And for me that morning, even though the commissioning, we had a commissioning service, Steve, Steve did the same thing. Those were really, really cool, cool things. But for me, the commissioning was, was that moment of that morning of going in and stepping. That was the validation from only that God could do in my life, that the commission that he's called me into was what I was supposed to do. Because you got to remember, God always calls folks who are just average guys, average people, Average men and women, he always chooses those that you don't think would do the such thing. I would have never guessed back then that even the opportunities of getting to do the things that we do. We had this whole big event. I don't know if you guys, did you guys get a chance to go to the skit guys about a couple weeks ago in um, Pella? Man, I tell you what, we had a great opportunity. We had an event. We had over 1,600 people show up at Vermeer Pavilion. And the thing that was so cool is I looked out the window and I was watching people that were coming to the event. We're sitting here at Vermeer. Not only was the Vermeer Mile packed, but it was clear into town. People were waiting to come to the event. And I think sometimes that's a little bit how it was for, for Jesus in the day. Which, here's John the Baptist. He's out, and he's baptizing people. 
And, and these people, it, says, it kind of showed in the video where people, he was, people were almost pushing people back because they didn't want John to get flooded in with all the people that were going to come and wanted to find salvation. Because you got to remember, these are Jewish people. This was things that was different because for the most part back then, the baptism was for the Gentile, not for the Jewish people. But John the Baptist called them out. And then on the side of it, here you see the scribes and the Pharisees, and they're standing back there looking at what is he doing? Who is this guy out here? Who's this Baptist? And the people were thinking, man, the Baptist, he's got to be the Messiah. But John the Baptist knew he was the voice of as Steve shared with you last week, he was the voice calling in the wilderness. Because there's a piece of scripture this morning I want you to look at with me. And I know you guys don't have it, but I want you to go. I want to, before we go to Luke, I want to go to Matthew 3, 13 through 16. Matthew 3, 13 through 16. And this is what the word of the Lord says. It says, then Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. Now, did you guys notice in that movie when we were watching that portion? Did you notice that here was Jesus, man? He was he was walking with authority. He was also walking with focus. I mean, this, this man has a destination. You ever see that? You, you ever watch that when people walk? You, you see a man or a woman, and they got, man, they got, they got, they got, they got focus. They got, they got, the position is moving. God is, God is walking. You know what I'm saying over here watching today, over here watching Steve and the music? I tell you what, the mu wasn't the music great this morning? It was fantastic. And I'm sitting there thinking, Steve's just going to cut a rug here. It's going to happen real quick because I'm just standing. He's holding back for all he's worth. I'm thinking, when's this man just going to do it? But that man walks with purpose. That's one thing I've always admired about Steve is Steve walks with purpose because he's got the Holy Spirit moving, just like Jesus when he's walking. Then it goes on for, if you guys can't tell, I'm just excited about God's word. It's really, really cool. And then it says, I am the one. He, John, he comes up to, to John, it, but John tried to talk him out of it. I am the one who needs to be baptized by you, he said, so why are you coming to me? Now, I think that's a good question because I'm sitting there thinking, here's John the Baptist. Now, these guys are cousins. Now, the, they, they, they met each other for the first time in the wombs of their mothers, right? And I find it interesting that the, the portion of John the Baptist, his ministry is for one year, and he's in the middle of it at that point because six months prior He's baptizing people. In the middle of his ministry of six months, he baptized Jesus. And then goes another six months, and then Herod puts him in prison. And it says, according to what they say in history, that John the Baptist spent a year in prison. And matter of fact, it was so dark, it was so dismal, that he even asked the question after he baptized the Messiah and says, Go and ask, is he the one? And Jesus goes and tells his cousin, you go back to the Baptist. You tell the blind are seen. The lame are walking. The lepers are being healed. And you tell him this. Because remember, 400 years span, we hear no prophet. We hear nothing from God, right? Nothing. It's dead quiet. But you go back and you tell, you go tell my cousin. There's no greater prophet than John the Baptist. Isn't that cool when you think about that? No greater calling. And I think that as men and women, you know, for our family and our friends can think, you know, man, God is on it. I see no greater things that are going on in the midst of our lives. And that's what, and that's what John was trying to do in the midst of his life. He, man, I can't, I can't baptize you, man. I got sin. And I'm saying, her thinking, as he, as he walks in the water, he looks up and he's thinking, do this he gets past because in his mind before jesus is just a cousin and now he walks in the water and all of a sudden he sees the son of man how can i do such a thing and he pushes back because we're going to look at another piece of scripture too this morning we're going to go back to luke chapter 3 and i think you guys got that for me luke chapter 3 21 through 23 and there's five pieces that are really, really important that we've got to look at. And it says this. One day, when the crowds were being baptized, Jesus himself was baptized. He was praying. The heavens opened. The Holy Spirit, in bodily form, descended on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven 
You are my dearly loved son. You bring great joy to me. Isn't that awesome? So the five things we need to look at real quick is this, is that crowds were being baptized. People, they were coming in masses. They were coming, they were coming, it just, and full, I think about that movie, Old Brother, Where Art Thou? You guys ever seen that movie, Old Brother, Where Art Thou? And these guys are lining up, they're, they're in lines headed in the, in the water. And here's, here's a George Clooney and his other two comrades are out there hanging out and they're watching what's going on. And here's this one guy, he's in there reading. Then all of a sudden you see something shift in his life. And man, he's beelining it into the water, you know, and getting in front of the line. And, and he's, he's all wet before he even gets to the pastor. And the pastor goes, takes him and boom, dunks him in there. Then he grabs the guy and he tells him all the sins that are going on. It's happened in his life. And he turns, and he goes about halfway back to the water, and he looks at his two comrades, and he goes, the water's fine. Come on in. Salvation is here. Well, George Clooney looks at him, and he says, that's all great, Elmer. But you walked off Piggly Wiggly a week ago, and the federal, the federal jurisdiction of the law still has a warrant out for your arrest, and you go back to prison. Yeah, but I confessed all that. I thought that was kind of cool. In his mind, in all the innocent, he confessed all the sins that was going on in his life. And there was the crowds that were going on in the midst of that, in, in the movie, and then also, too, in John the Baptist. Because then we got to look at the second thing that was going on in the midst of that, is that Jesus gets baptized. And we're going to look at the three reasons of why he did, but Jesus gets baptized. It's important. It's an important day. It's documented. It's, it's throughout the four Gospels that Jesus gets baptized. And then the third thing that happens is this. That praying, the heavens are open. Only in Luke do we find that Jesus is praying that the heavens are open. The only time in scripture that you read that portion is in the gospel of Luke. And I'm sitting here thinking, how many times do we take time in our own prayer life? Do we sense the very heavens open? And sometimes when you have those experiences, man, wow. You know, I felt that this morning was we're sitting there and we're singing, especially that third song with Matt and the, and the worship team was going. I felt for a brief period of time the heavens were open, and, and I was just hoping, man, wouldn't it be cool sometimes in church we could just break out and we can just let go, and we're just praising God. The heavens are open. I believe someday we're going to see that. I remember when we, were, when we had the event with the skit guys were coming through, and the crowds were coming through. It was, it was like a mat. We had a red carpet thing, and people, you couldn't even look. You had to walk forward. Just a mass of people coming. And I was, I was standing next to Charlie Cope, and I said, what do you see, Charlie? I see people coming in the door. I said, yeah, but, but look, what do you see? I think that's going to be like heaven someday. It just be flooded with crowds. They're coming. We're coming to worship the king. We're coming, we're coming to worship Jesus. We get, to, we get to hang out with God. We get, we get to see the Holy Spirit for who he is. He's not, he's not this thing that moves around and we can't see, but he just, we just get to see all those things. It's going to be a cool time. And then the fourth thing that goes is this, is that the spirit descends like a dove. Now, a lot of times we equate that as an actual dove, but it wasn't. It said it was such a peaceful blessing that was coming down out of the sky that it, it seemed like a dove that was falling on Jesus. My heart yearns for the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit falls on people when they're getting down and they're broken and they're praising God and the spirit falls and jumps all over the place and you see people coming in they're confessing th sin and they're praising God cool things happen when people get in the midst of their brokenness and say here I am that'll be a cool thing I think those are things that we need to look at in our own lives and the fifth thing is this he hears God's voice he hears the voice of God. Now, the thing that I appreciate so much about this is this, because we have the three reasons of why he was baptized that I think we need to look at this morning is this. Baptism gave approval to John's ministry. He wanted to tell John, what you're doing is right. What you're doing, because that's a prerequisite of what the commands, because it says in the Great Commission, go and make disciples, baptizing them, Right? So it's important for us as a people because when we get baptized, we go into the water with the midst of the sin and that we're recognizing the repentance and we come out and our sins are washed away. They're gone. The second thing is this, is that he identified himself with tax collectors and sinners, the very people he came to save. That's us. 
he identified himself in baptism because he wanted to hang around with his people, his creation. That is us in this room. We get the opportunity to live out what God has in our lives. And the third thing is this, and this is the most important reason of anything. If you don't remember anything that I share with you this morning, remember this. The main reason he baptized was the picture that future baptism of the cross when the water of God's judgment would sweep over him. So we have a great picture of the baptism, not only in the water, but the baptism of why he's hanging on the cross. And all the sins of everything that you and I have ever done is taken and is swiped away in the midst of the baptism of the cross. And then Jesus goes and hears the last thing that why it comes up out of baptism. He says, my beloved son, I am so proud of you. I, it goes back to a time this, uh, this fall with my, my son. He was, he was playing football, varsity football, senior year. We're in, we're in the second round of the playoffs. We're playing Washington, who went to all the way to the finals in the playoffs. Tough game, physical game that was going on. Well, in the middle of the second quarter, my stepson catches a pass, and he gets so hit so hard, and he hits the ground, and he get, jumps back up, and he's going to the other side. He's trying to get the huddle of Washington. So they run out and they grab him. He got his belt off. He was disoriented. He didn't even know where he was at. And then all of a sudden, the emotion hits him. And he comes back, and I said, man, he's distraught. I can't go back to the game. It's over. I played since my senior year. I'll never put the helmet on again. And then they go to the halftime, and they come out, and my wife and I were just, my wife just, man, she's, she's just so concerned about her son and what's going on. And they said, hey, I'll get to him when he comes out of the locker room. All the men come out. All the young men come out of the locker room. And the last one to come out is my, my stepson. He comes. And he jumps into my arms. He goes, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. And he falls into my arms. He says, oh, Mike. Mike, I can't play. I can't. I can't. I can't go back out on the field. And I grab him and I hug him. I said, Ryder, I love you. You've played hard. It's okay. But now I want you to go out with, your, with the young men, and you need to still lead because he's a captain in football. That's why Harrison Barr, he, he has a passion to play, but he can't play anymore. And Harris, you need to show me that, that I love you. And I think that's what happened when Jesus, when he came out of the water, it sounded like, it sounded like a thunder. Here's the scribes and the Pharisees judging him. Who's this guy, the Messiah? But nothing mattered because it's all about the event. It's all about the commission. This is my son. I love him. He's going to do great things. He's going to do great things in my glory. And I think those are the things that we got to look back and we, as we look into baptism because we come to the last question I want you guys to think about today is this. In what ways do we need to submit our own lives to Jesus to be an example for others to follow? Men like John the Baptist, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Peter, the disciple John, Paul. Men and women throughout the Bible making an impact on other people's lives that they had to submit. That's what Jesus did. When he went into the water, he was under submission to the Father. Lord, this is why you called me to do this. You want me to associate with those of your creation. And so I just encourage you, what is the thing that God's calling you to do? Sometimes in the midst of the pain of, of, of love, we don't always hear that from our parents. Maybe this morning you've got some parent wounds. You've got some things that are going. Maybe there was a wound that was done to you when you were growing up by a family member, by a friend. Maybe even today you've got a wound that's inside of you that's maybe from a, from a spouse that's left. But I'm going to promise you this. Jesus 
loves you. If he hadn't, he wouldn't have went to a point of a baptism, three and a half years of a journey, to die on a cross. That's the impact he makes on our lives so that at the end of the day, we have hope. Amen? I'm going to bring the worship team up, and as we are, I'm going to have a word of prayer, and I'm going to turn it back over to Matt. Dear Jesus, I just want to thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity as a people that we can come. We can sit and we can praise you and we stand, we praise you by song and praise. And Lord, too, we've also opened up the word. We've opened up the pieces of scripture that you spoke. Lord, I pray that what we've learned today about the baptism, it's more than the event. It's more than the commission. It's living out a transformed. Lord, I just pray that in the midst of brokenness, you came to a broken people. And Lord, I just pray that those that have heart wounds today would tune those wounds back to you. And they can trust you, Jesus, because you are the Messiah. You are the King of kings. You are the Christ. And that's why we're here today, is to serve you. During that last time of worship, I was completely overcome with emotion. And I, as I was, as I was praying through that, I, the reason why is because, you know, I think for every single believer, there's that moment where you know that your life will never be the same again. And you cross that line and you do it because of the love of God, your heavenly father that says, hey, you're, you're my son. I love you. And see, when you really latch on to that, there is no going back. There's none. And I was brought back to that time in my life where I know God said, Steve, I love you. And I'm never, I'm never going back. Never. And see, that, that just takes that moment. And and we're singing that song, and if you were in our Heaven series, you know that's the song that sang in heaven. You know, we, we overcome. It was by His authority, His victory. It's all His, but we overcame. And it's just, you know, for those of us that have crossed that line, and we're never going back, it's a huge affirmation. And it's just everything there is. So I just want to urge you, as you leave here today, you know what's waiting for you. Things are out there, whether it be family or co-workers or whatever means that the enemy uses to try to tell you you're something you're not. To try to tell you that you're lower than who God says you are. When you leave here today, please stand and receive a blessing. When you leave here today and when that battle begins, you remember this blessing. And as you leave here, you go knowing the love of God the Father the grace of our son, of the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the fellowship and the power of the Holy Spirit, now and always. God bless you. You're dismissed. Have a good week.